All right, these are the second half of the 4.5 notes. These are the logarithmic equations. So we got two types, um, two formats for solving log on one side and log on both sides. Log on one side has kind of a similar start, at least, to the exponential where you want to isolate. So isolate the logarithmic part of the equation. Uh, once that's done, then we're going to do a rewrite. So when you get down to a single log, and you're trying to solve for x, you need a way to get the log out of the problem. And the way to do that is just rewrite exponentially, and it's gone. Pretty easy step, actually. So the first thing, again, will be just getting the solving going. Let's start out with getting that variable isolated. Sorry, getting that log isolated. So down just a log of 2x is equal to 2. So subtract 4 divided by 3. Subtract 4, 12 divided by 3. Now the rewrite part of this is you can't really do any more solving at LOG, so get rid of it. And the way you get rid of it is do the rewrite. What I'm curious of before I rewrite is can you figure out the solution to the question without me doing the rewrite? The rewrite would be base to the exponent equals number. So if you do base to the exponent equals number, what do you get? Solve for x. No more work. If you take a second to think about it, and some of you guys are probably already there. The answer is, well, let's check it out. So when you got plain LOG, you got base 10. So the rewrite would be 10 to the fourth is equal to 2x. 10 to the fourth being 10,000. So I think you can go from here to here with no work in between. Because the rewrite, just like kind of other like baby steps, if you want to call it that, can be down in your head. 10 to the fourth, 10,000. Divided by 2, 5,000, done. Okay. If you need those steps in between again, of course, that's fine. You can do that. The idea would always be to get yourself down to a single log before you rewrite. So in this first problem, that was pretty easy. A couple of quick algebra steps, and I was there. In the second one, we're going to apply the laws. So we're seeing now that subtraction is division, so get myself down to a single log. And do you guys see what I did there? The subtraction is division, but I didn't do any actually division. Not on paper I didn't. I did it in my head. What did I do? x squared minus 1 over x plus 1, but x squared minus 1 is the difference of squares. Factor and cancel. So what I didn't do, and I don't need to see, That was just a bunch of waste of time. Right? I just killed time. Quiz or test that I don't need to do. So don't. Subtraction is division, factor, and cancel. Good to go. And then solve. No more work. The answer is what? Now, how to do that? No work. Well, in my head, I did a conversion. Rewrite 10 to the third, which is 100, equals x minus 1. Add 1 to the other side, x is 101. What would you show exactly? What would you want to show? Some of you guys are going, I would want to show. And I'm like, you know, fine. Go ahead and do that if you want to. But again, you're killing time. Unnecessary stuff here, right? OK. So log on one side, a pretty easy way to, to go. Just get that log isolated, rewrite exponentially. Solving tends to be pretty easy. Let's sh show you guys log on both sides. Log on both sides actually just as easy. What we do with log on both sides, we try to get down to a single log, one log on each side, and that allows us to use a property, which says if you can get down to log of the same base of two different expressions, you can drop the log and set the expressions equal. So basically logs drop is our method here. But yes, you got to get them together. So addition is multiplication, so this is log base 2. Uh, x squared minus 6x, so x times x minus 6 is equal to log base 2 of 40. So I used uh, one of the laws, the first law, addition is multiplication, got those two condensed, and then now the logs can drop. And we get to this point, hopefully you see real quick where it's going. So 
So a factoring problem, right? So you know, the algebra never goes away. It's always there somehow, start, middle, end, whatever. You're doing algebra at some point. So the logs in the exponential stuff sort of becomes a little bit insignificant. It's just about manipulation. So you can do the algebra. Okay, and then solutions, right? So Now the one thing about log equations is they have to be checked. And I didn't do that back here, so I'm going to back up for a sec. Um, you, what are you checking for? The number you get when plugged back in has to be positive. Produce a positive in the parentheses because you can't log negative and you can't log zero. Now you put 5,000 back in, you're good. Put 101 back in, you're good. In for x. But if you, when I say you're good, that's because they cause positive me to log a positive number. In this instance, if I put 10 back in, I'm good. But if I put negative 4 in, I'm not. Negative 4 right here is causing me to log base 2 of a negative number. And that's, again, not possible. So this is the point where no solutions show up. I should say not no solution, but you have to check your solutions. And at least it doesn't work. This one does. So log equations, check your solutions. It's possible that one of them does just what happened here. It's one of those things you just have to remember, not like it's a big extra step or something. OK, another log on both sides. So condense. So subtraction is division. I think what you guys will find yourself doing, just like some of the other problems, is you'll start cutting out a little bit of work. And you might be able to go from, for example, from here right to here. And I don't need to necessarily see the log on both sides. I get that you've got the logs to drop. Is your, are your expressions correct? And like here, the logs are going to drop also. OK, logs are going to drop also. And then I went copy it down. Sorry about that. There we go. Multiply both sides by x, subtract 12x over the other side. I'm going to factor. So factoring tends to be a little bit of a theme here because of the kind of expressions you're combining when you do the laws or do get rid or drop your logs. Logs, either way. Uh, 14, fine. When I plug it back in for x, negative 2 not. Negative 2 would cause negative and negative here, and you can't log a negative. So again, those would be your extraneous or extra solutions. So three overall methods. Exponential, isolate the exponential part, log both sides. Log on one side, isolate the log, rewrite to exponential. Log on both sides, get it down to a single log on both sides, drop the logs. Now, before we summarize and give you kind of a, I'll have a slide to summarize, let's do a couple of quick word problems. We may, may not do with the entire problems all the way through, but just get to the point where, like, what is the solving process we just talked about? Like, what does it do for you? So here's that inve same investment problem we talked about a couple of days ago, the lump sum investment where I drop in, chuck of money, and just let it sit for a number of years. But this time, the question is about how much time would it take to double your money? Well, if you look at the, either one of the two equations up top, time is an exponent. So now you're solving for an exponent. So this problem becomes an exponential and solve for the exponent, which means you'll have to, at some point, log both sides, bring your exponent down. In the setup of this, time it takes to double your money. Now here's the thing about the doubling, right? It's 4,000, so I know double is 8,000. I could actually start my problem by just doing this. Now, me plugging some stuff in there, my interest rate was 8%, so that's my R. N, quarterly, how many times I compound a year? Four times a year. NT, so 4T. But I did two. Where's the 4,000? Well, if you're going to double your money, that means your balance on the account should end up being 8,000 twice what you put in, which is 4,000. Well, the very first thing I'm going to do in that black part of the problem is divide both sides by 4,000, so I'd be at two. So if you're doubling your money, what's the point? You, know, you wouldn't even need to know what you wouldn't even know it was four thousand. That would actually have no bearing on the problem. 
just double any amount of money. Now, yeah, I'd want to know how much I was doubling what I started with, but I could just say double your money and it's going to be a two. You wouldn't even need to know the starting amount. If you look at the red equation, it looks a lot like one of the first problems from the first half of the notes. It's exponential. And so what we're going to do is log both sides, bring our exponent down, start solving. Now in here, maybe a little bit of cleanup. I suppose I might call this 1.02. Log both sides, bring my exponent down. So I would do log 2. You could do log base 2. That's up to you. I kind of just like log 10. Log base 2 of 2 would make that one side a 1. But then when I go to the other side, I have to do log base 2, use my, you know, my special key on my calculator. If I just do, always do log base 10, I never have to go to another place. On my calculator, I can just hit the LOG button right in the front face of the of this calculator, and I'm good. So I just like log base 10 myself. But you guys can do whatever you like there. So log both sides, bring your exponent down. Then the solving would be, you know, solve for t. Now remember, log of a number is another number, so your t expression looks like this. Go to your calculator. So that number, whatever it is, is the doubling time. How much time it takes to double your investment under these conditions, which is quarterly. So really, you create an exponential and you solve it the same way we would do, like I said, like the first part of the notes. If you go continuous, you're operating off of PERT, still to E to the R, interest rate point zero eight T. So again, I'm not putting in 8,000, 4,000, I'm just saying doubling, so I don't need to put those numbers in. This time you LN both sides. When you do enough of this, which you guys will do plenty, you start to just get in the habit of LN of E to an exponent is an exponent. You don't write down the LN on the other side, you just kind of go. And really what I would say from the blue, you could go all the way to T is equal to I would be fine with the only work being that to an answer. Right? Okay. Again, you know, if you want more, you can always do more. All right. Let's try one more, and we'll wrap it up for the videos here. So. You know, we did the financial problem the first day. We also did the infectious disease problem, which was a different looking exponential model. Um, these are the kind of population growth models. So the infection or the virus spread in a, as a population growth idea, the virus is spreading. In this case, we're talking about um, a deer population, which Eden Prairie actually has a pretty good deer population, if you guys realize it or not. And so uh, a population growth model. Now the thing about growth models is when you look at growth models, they tend to not be over long periods of time because uh, they, don't, they don't hold up, right? Things will change, like if you think about how much undeveloped space was in Eden Prairie 10, 15 years ago, compared to now. If you go down Eden Prairie Road, the old Eden Prairie Road, um, I, used to drive, I drive that on my way home from work and literally there used to be no houses out there, it was just land, nothing. Now you got developments on both sides of the road as you go down the hill there. So, you know, again, that's tricking the, the land, so the deer's space is getting you know, brought their space is shrinking, excuse me. So when their land shrinks, food source, habitat, whatever. So you know, the point is, uh, population models, growth models don't sustain themselves for very long because conditions often change. Um, disease, predators, you know, you name it, right? So we're just gonna run through this one. You know, you know we're gonna be solving for time, obviously, because we're talking about these solving questions. How do we solve for the variable? So clearly you're gonna get to that point somewhere in the problem. Um, this one has a couple of those kind of getting started questions, like in the model, um, how many deer were there beginning? Now, this is 93 to 2000, so the data is a little bit old, but it's actually real data for the city of Eden Prairie. And when you do anything initial, we know time is zero, so we plug in zero. We plug in zero for the model. You don't even need to calculate to do this because if you think about it, e to the zero is one, so you got 40 divided by 10, so there were four. Okay? Now, you might go, there were only four deer. Okay, read the problem, right? In hundreds is one of those little catchy things that you gotta watch out for. So the model says four, but it's in hundreds. So initially in 93, when they started collecting the data, there was a four, their population was 400 here. 
when you go to the year 2000, you're just going to go 93 to 2000. Again, this is kind of the easy stuff, I think. Um, so the model would be seven years out. Or at the end of the time they're collecting data, let's just check out the growth of the population over this time. So plug it in. Now this one, yeah, because it's not an exponent of zero, you go to calculation. So go to your calculator, get a number. Assuming the population continues, the growth model continues, which I said a minute ago, that's probably not realistic for long periods of time, but assuming it continues maybe for a little bit longer, in what year did the population reach 1800? got to be a little bit careful here because remember the model was in hundreds. If you say 1800 in that equation, that's going to be way off. So you actually got to plug in 18. One of those little catchy things. Um, now what I would do with this is the same thing I showed you at the very beginning of the first video, which is isolate the, the exponential part of the problem and then log both sides, solve for t. So it's going back to one of those problems again. Now what I'm doing here is, you know, trying to cut out a little bit of work but show you enough work. I think you guys can handle these steps. Multiply both sides by the denominator. At the same time, divide both sides by 18. Subtract the 1 over and then I can also divide by 9. How much of this you want to clean up? Doesn't, you know, you don't have to really do any kind of cleanup. Calculator will handle whatever mess you want to put into it. But if you feel like you want to reduce the fraction, get this to be a single, this to be a single number, then divide by 9, which you really wouldn't have to. So let's say we did um, 40 over 18 minus 18 over 18. So we're 22 over 18. And then you reduce it down to 11 over 9. So you could do all that, say 11 ninths, then divide by 9. So now we're at 11 81st. I don't know that all that stuff is necessary. It makes you feel better to have a nice, clean looking fraction on the other side. Um, you could. But ultimately, the calculator will take the mess, so the mess is OK. Now log both sides when you export it down. Okay, that's going to be the end of the notes. What you guys will notice, I think, throughout the whole theme is solving one way or the other. Get your methods down. Tons of algebra in here. Fraction manipulation. A little bit of pre-calc. To me, the little bit of pre-calc is just the idea of how you manipulate the logs, uh, how you LN both sides, knowing the methods for which problem, but it's a lot of algebra, and that's what's going to be the key for you guys on these uh, problems. Okay, that's it for 4.5.